Introduction to Solutions in Aqueous Reactions Predicting Spontaneous Single Replacement Reactions In this tutorial, we will be going over the activity of metals and chemical reactions, location, 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 single replacement reactions in the activity series, spontaneous redox reactions explained, the activity of nonmetals and chemical reactions, predicting the products of single replacement reactions, and finally, simple single replacement redox reactions. The activity of metals and chemical reactions. The chemical activity of metals can be broadly defined as the ability to lose valence electrons in order to achieve a full outer valence shell of electrons. Metals are listed in order of decreasing activity decreasing ability to oxidize, losing electrons, and decreasing tendency to lose electrons. So over here we have table J of the activity series. Now this is in the New York State Regents Reference Table. So if you're not from New York State, you're not going to recognize this, but it's a nice little graphic to show a very basic understanding of the activity of metals, where your most active metals are at the top and your least active metals are at the bottom. So just like I said right here, the most active metals are found at the top left of the chart, and these are going to oxidize or lose electrons most easily. And we're going to be using this chart a lot during this video. So let's take a closer look at the location of the metals. Your most active metals. These are metals that are found in group one and group two. For example, Li, K, Sr, Mg, they're going to be at the very top. So pretty much your group one and your group two metals, if we look at these, are all at the top. Your less active metals, your transition metals, are found sort of in the middle, like titanium, iron, nickel, sort of in this, well, not magnesium, but sort of in this middle area. Now the metals below hydrogen are going to be your least active, and hydrogen is obviously most definitely a non-metal but it is the standard by which all activities of metals are measured. So I understand that we have hydrogen in our activity series for metals, but it's done on purpose because it's a way to measure the activity of all other metals. So again, hydrogen is a non-metal. Keep that in mind here. Your least active metals are our coinage metals. So copper, silver, gold. They are all found at the bottom of our activity series. Single replacement reactions in the activity series. Reactants contain one free element and one ionic compound dissolved in water. This is the way that we've defined single replacement reactions. Now in a symbolic form, we can think of, here's my lone element A, and it is with an ionic compound BX. A is more active than B. When A interacts with BX, A is going to take the place of B, so this is my new product, and B is pushed out by itself. So the more active element will replace a less active element. Now, metals typically replace metals, and nonmetals, which we'll talk about in a minute, replace nonmetals. All single replacement reactions are redox reactions, and we'll look at that closer in a moment. When an activity series is not available, like in our AP class, using the relative position of elements on the periodic table can serve as a general guide to evaluate relative chemical activity of metals. So you know, group one and group two metals are going to be your most active metals. Your transition metals are sort of middle of the road and your metals that you can handle with your hand and not worry or wear, like copper, silver, gold, are going to be your least active metals. Let's look at this example. Solid copper reacts with silver nitrate to form copper two nitrate in silver. Now this reaction definitely happens and it only occurs in one direction, copper replacing the silver ion because here's my copper, it's going to go in, it's gonna kick out the silver, the silver is by itself and then we symbolically form this CuNO32. Now if we look at table J, here is copper right here, here is silver down here. Since copper is above silver on table J, 
it has the ability to replace it. This will happen. Now, this will not occur in reverse because silver cannot replace copper. Copper loses its electron more readily than silver. It's more active. So, in AP chemistry, during the electrochemistry unit closer to the end of the year, a more quantitative approach will be explored to evaluate chemical activity in determination of the spontaneity of a chemical reaction. What I'm basically saying is that we'll be able to put a number to this to make sure that you understand what's more active, what's less active. This is just more of a qualitative approach right now. The activity of nonmetals and chemical reactions. So your most active nonmetals are found near the top right side of the chart on the New York State Reference Table J. So we all know that fluorine is our most reactive nonmetal. This is going to reflect the organization of group 17 on the periodic table. We can also see this trend reflected in a reductions potential chart, which used to be in our AP chemistry reference tables, but no longer is. Instead, on a question, they would isolate just the elements that you need to know, and they would give these things called reduction potentials, which again, we're going to learn about later. But if we look at this trend of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, we can see the same trend over here, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So we're going to use both of these charts to look at reactivity of nonmetals. These nonmetals will reduce or gain electrons most easily. And when we look at single replacements, nonmetal elements are going to replace nonmetals. Predicting spontaneous redox reactions. So again, copper, Cu, can replace silver because it is above silver on table J. Copper cannot replace magnesium because here's copper right here. Magnesium is way up above. You cannot go in the opposite direction. So let's look at and predict whether these reactions will occur. Can Zn replace Ag in the compound AgNO3? So will this reaction occur? Well, where's Zn? Here's Zn and here is Ag. Zn is above Ag, so Yes, this will occur. Let's look at another example. Can Cu replace the potassium in potassium carbonate? Well, here is Cu, and here is potassium way up there. So can Cu go up and replace potassium? No, no it cannot. Cu is less active than potassium. Here's our next example. Can aluminum replace hydrogen in sulfuric acid. And again, you might be saying, wait a second here, hydrogen is a nonmetal. That is true, but remember, hydrogen is part of our activity series for metals. So here's aluminum, and where is it? Here's hydrogen. Since aluminum is above hydrogen on this activity series, will this reaction happen? Yes, and we can go on and predict our products. So let's get into more detail of what this looks like. We're going to bring together a lot of concepts here, net ionic equations and redox reactions and predicting single replacement reactions. So our first question here is can Zn replace cobalt? Well, if we look at our table J right here, here is Zn and here is, where's cobalt? Where are you? Oh, there's cobalt. So is Zn higher than cobalt on table J? Yes, it is. So yes, this will happen. Now, knowing that this will happen, we're going to say, okay, Zn is going to come and kick out the cobalt. So Zn is going to replace the cobalt. We know Zn is plus two. So if we have Zn plus two and NO3 minus one, and we form our product here, we're going to have Zn NO3, 2, and then the cobalt is going to get kicked out by itself. So we're going to form solid cobalt. And then we're going to go back and look at this. Do we need to balance it? One Zn, one Zn, one cobalt, one cobalt, one nitrate, two nitrates, two nitrates. We're good. All right, now what we want to do is our complete ionic equation. So Zn plus CO plus 2 plus 2N. O3 minus 1 yields Zn plus 2 plus 
2NO3 minus 1 plus C. Oh, excellent. And I'm doing this on purpose because I want to identify what spectator ions are existing here and then I want to get rid of them before I go on to my net ionic equation. So the nitrate ions are spectator ions. They are going to go away. So when I rewrite my net ionic equation, now I'm going to make sure that I have oxidation uh, numbers associated with everything. So for my net ionic equation, I'm going to put Zn0 plus CO plus 2 yields Zn plus 2 plus CO0. And everything here needs to have an oxidation number with it. Like hands down, you don't put one, I'm going to mark it wrong. So hardcore here, people, make sure you have your oxidation states. But now that I see this, I can go on and figure out what's being oxidized and what's being reduced and write my oxidation and reduction half reactions. So Zn is going from zero to plus two. That means it is going to go, that means it's going to undergo oxidation. So Zn zero yields Zn plus two plus two electrons. Okay, two electrons lost, fantastic. Now let's look at what's happening with the cobalt. Cobalt is going from plus two to zero. My oxidation numbers are decreasing. That means it's being reduced. So I'm going to gain electrons. So CO plus two plus two electrons, because I looked at the change in oxidation numbers already, yields CO zero. Fantastic. And because we balanced it ahead of time, two electrons lost, two electrons gained, it's all good. So what species is being oxidized? Zn0 is being oxidized. Make sure you put that zero. You need to have it there. You just can't put Zn. What species is being reduced? Well, that would be CO plus two. So that's our first example. Let's go on and do another. So we have the beginning of a molecular equation, copper plus NaCl. Will this even happen? Well, let's take a look, shall we? So here's copper and here's sodium. Here it is way up here. Will this happen? Well, that would be a big fat no. That can't happen. The copper metal would just sink to the bottom of a solution of sodium chloride. So it is absolutely fine for you to just put dashes all through here. You can write no reaction, no reaction, no reaction all the way through, or you can just put on dashes and move on with your life. Let's look at another example, but now we have the situation where a non-metal is going to try to replace a non-metal. Will this happen? Well, chlorine is above bromine on our table J. So chlorine can replace bromine, which means yes, this reaction will happen. Knowing that the chlorine is going to come in and kick out the bromine and take its spot. So Na plus one Cl minus one, that's gonna give us N a c l just be really good and put the aqueous there plus and now the bromine is going to be by itself and we know that bromine is a diatomic so br2 now i need to balance this so two bromines here i need two bromines on my reactant side two sodiums two sodiums chlorines are balanced good we're good to go so now let's write our complete ionic equation so the diatomic chlorine of course is going to stay together the sodium bromide is very soluble, so 2Na plus 1 plus 2Br minus 1 yields sodium chloride, of course, is very soluble, so 2Na plus 1 plus 2Cl minus 1 plus our diatomic bromine at the end. The next step is to go through and identify our spectator ions and remove those. So we can see 2Na plus 1 and 2Na plus 1 are on both sides. We're going to get rid of those. So now we're going to write our net ionic equation, including oxidation numbers. Cl20 plus 2Br minus 1 yields 2Cl minus 1 plus Br2 zero. So great. Everything has an oxidation number. We can now go on and look at our oxidation half reactions. 
If we look at Cl2, we see Cl2 is going from 0 to negative 1. Well, that's not an oxidation half reaction, and you have to be careful about that. The first element that's listed might not be what's being oxidized. A lot of times it is, and people get lulled into this sense of security that, oh, the first element that I come across is going to be oxidized. But in this case, no. Cl20 is going to 2Cl minus 1. So that's my reduction half reaction. So we're going to write it down here. So Cl0, the little 2 right there, is going to gain, each chlorine atom is going to gain two electrons to get its full octet and become 2Cl minus 1, two chlorine ions with its full octet. Now the oxidation half reaction, we have Br minus 1 going to Br2 0. Hey, that definitely lost electrons. My oxidation numbers are becoming more positive. So 2Br minus 1 arrow, Br2 0 with two electrons lost because we have two bromine ions, so they each have eight valence electrons. They're each going to lose one valence electron to get seven valence electrons apiece, come together, form a covalent bond between them, and release the two electrons. So what species is oxidized? Well, Br minus one is oxidized. What's reduced? Cl2 zero is being reduced. And again, if you want to put the two in front of the Br minus one, you absolutely can, but it's not necessary. Let's look at our next example. Can I2 come in and replace F? And if you automatically think, well, no, Dr. English, that is not possible because iodine is much farther down in group 17, therefore much less reactive. Can it replace F2? No, it cannot. So this reaction is not going to happen. So because this reaction is not going to happen, I'm just going to put lines through all of this to, to acknowledge the fact that this reaction will not occur. So therefore, we're good to go. And you can just leave them like that. So what did you learn in this tutorial? We talked about the activity of metals in chemical reactions, the importance of location, 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 whether in an activity series or on a periodic table, single replacement reactions in the activity series, spontaneous redox reactions explained, the activity of nonmetals in chemical reactions, predicting the products of single replacement reactions, and finally, we looked at some examples of simple single replacement redox reactions. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.